Good morning. Uh, I hope you're all very well. Can I ask you to quickly type into the chat box to see if you can hear me? Okay, just a simple uh, yes in the in the box would be really uh, helpful. Fabulous. Well, uh, thank you everybody for taking your time out of your morning to to listen to myself, and we'll talk to you about the data protection challenges uh, for 2020 and beyond. Um, you'll know that what we've done is we've got slides that we're going to talk to and then we're opening the floor to you for any question, not just about the discussion that we're going to go through today, but any data protection question. And I'll caveat that with data protection question um, that you may have uh, for Will and I and we'll do our best to answer that. So I won't answer questions as we talk. I'll wait till the end um, of the session. So I'm just going to introduce us. So as you know, hopefully, I'm Kelly, I'm the co-founder of Data Basics, um, and I regularly do uh, these webinars to provide practical uh, advice. And um, we'll kindly agree to join me. Um, um, if you've got no audio, I'm not quite sure, because I'm only doing this through the webinar. Sorry, I've got a question about audio. Um, there is no telephone line um, attached to um, this webinar unfortunately, but I can send you the recording and that may help uh, afterwards. So I just apologize um, for that. Um, so um, I'm Kelly and I'm gonna ask Will just to quickly uh, introduce uh, yeah. himself. Hi, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Will, I'm a director at Free Solicitors and uh, my I specialize in data protection. I do um, data protection litigation uh, and also advisory work. Uh, and I've been working in that area for about 15 years. Excellent. So I think there are some um, audible audio uh, challenges and I'm just gonna uh, challenge to see if we can uh, work what that is out. But as we go along, I'm gonna ask Will to start off yeah. talking and I'll work out what's going on with the audio. Yeah, so we, we've put together just a, a checklist of some basics that we're assuming for the purposes of this presentation uh, everyone has already thought about and familiar with. Uh, needless to say, um, if there's anything on here that, that concerns you or that you're, you're not sure what that is, do get in touch with, with Kelly or myself um, in order to, to, to talk that through. I'm not going to go into the detail of these, but these are all the sort of fundamentals that should have been put in place uh, by the middle of 2018 uh, to make sure that as a business, you're doing the basics, um, recognizing what data you're processing, uh, putting in place the appropriate safeguards, thinking about your accountability requirements. So you've got record keeping and the ability to answer questions from regulators or, or supply chain sort of counterparts. And then also thinking about what might go wrong, uh, breach procedures uh, and the technical and organizational security measures that, that should be in place. Uh, as I say, not, not going to spend a lot of time on that, but refer back to that slide if there's anything that uh, you're not sure you fully addressed. And, and obviously, one or other of us will be very happy to, to help you with those. And I think for me, what I have found uh, a lot recently is when I talk to people about the practical application of the regulation, um, I talk about, for example, um, retention schedules and people say to me well what is a retention schedule so I provide them with a bit of advice about you know what's the minimum amount of time that you should be holding data and the maximum um, amount of time but the question I always get is well how do we actually enforce that so I think for me if you're going to do this checklist and you come up with a privacy notice or you understand what your uh, individual rights are or you are writing a retention schedule is it needs to be relevant to your business it needs to be something that you can enforce so if you're going to be holding data for six years for example you need some kind of system or process that's going to remind you every year that there will be records that you will have to uh, clean remove delete shred um, or in some circumstances, um, keep. So this checklist isn't just a one and done. It's, okay, now we've done this. Are you doing the regular uh, training? You know, uh, do you know if your contracts are regularly up to date? You know, you might have had them two years ago, but are they relevant um, today? So this is, GDPR is an ongoing uh, compliance challenge. And I know uh, not everybody I've encountered 
appreciates the fact that it is an ongoing challenge uh, for all of us. And the only other point I would quickly make is if you're using any kind of technical system, can you please make sure um, that your software is kept up to date? Um, I think there are too many cases where systems and software are out of date. It makes you vulnerable to um, breaches um, and it can cause you a lot of pain. I know it can be expensive, but please make sure that you adhere to your security uh, plan. Yes, so um, the topics we wanted to try and cover this morning is sort of moving past that level of basic sort of business as usual uh, compliance and looking ahead to some of the challenges. And obviously the first thing on that list is Brexit because for anyone um, who's dealing with data in the UK, uh, particularly where you've got European operations or, or operations further afield, um, Brexit is going to have uh, implications. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're starting to see more guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office uh, about particular aspects of processing activity. Uh, and there have been some quite important developments around that. So we'll spend a bit of time on that mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Um, so the next kind of slides are us going into each of these points in a little more uh, detail. And obviously, if you've got some questions, we'll take them at the end. So um, let's talk about Brexit. You know, at the end of this week, uh, essentially, we are leaving Europe, but we are in then the withdrawal um, agreement. So from your perspective, Will, uh, what does this mean yeah. uh, for data protection? So, so in the short term, it doesn't mean a lot. There's There's been quite a lot um, of commentary about the January date and the suggestion in particular that you might therefore have to have a, an authorised person to represent you within Europe after that day. In fact, um, nothing much will change at the end of January from a data protection point of view. We'll still be governed by GDPR. We'll still be treated as if we're a member state for the rest of 2020. The challenging time will come at, at the end of 2020 when the transition period comes to an end. At the moment, we're told that's a hard cut off, uh, not likely to be extended. And the question then will be, what are the implications for transfers uh, in and out of uh, or between the UK and, and, and mainland Europe? At that point, the UK will become like any other third country, like, like the US or South Africa, or India, um, countries that don't have an adequacy agreement in place necessarily uh, and need to be able to justify transfers of data. And what the ICO said is that um, Europe uh, will be continue to be treated as an adequate destination for the purposes of our legislation, so transfers out from the UK shouldn't be a problem, um, but transfers inbound are, are more problematic. And this is where we're already starting to see warnings from uh, CNIL, which is the French data regulator, the Data Protection Commissioner in, in, in Ireland, uh, and others uh, talking about uh, the likelihood of the UK regime being regarded as adequate after the end of 2020, and particularly because of um, considerations like national security and the, the very high level of surveillance that takes place in this country of, um, of data traffic and, and data at rest. Um, that there's there's a strong sense that maybe uh, the UK won't be adequate, which means that the easiest um, and most sort of blanket way of carrying on doing those transfers won't be available. It doesn't mean there aren't any other solutions, though. Yeah, and I think um, for me, I think one of the first things that you really should be doing, if you haven't already, is identify uh, your European customers that are sending you personal data for you to be processing so that you understand where the risks currently lie for you and make sure that you put in the appropriate um, measures. And at the moment, I think that is making sure that you have uh, contracts in place that are that you can actually fulfill and that you can um, adhere to in terms of the technical aspects of it, that you do have policies and procedures uh, in place and that you don't just sign agreements that are given to you by your European customers. You read them and understand what they are actually asking you to sign and that you're confident that you can sign it. And if you're not, I would certainly advocate that you speak to someone with legal expertise um, around that. I know certainly the question I get a lot is what do we mean by a European representative? Um, 
and certainly the guidance I've seen is somebody that is in the country that you're going to be acting in, so a, someone based in one of the European member states um, that can act on your behalf. So that may be a law firm or it may be uh, someone that has the necessary skills. I don't know if you have a view um, on that, Will. Well, I mean, it, it can it can be a range of different things, but there's a couple of things to bear in mind. And one is that they take on a certain degree of responsibility for sort of um, engaging on your behalf with the regulator, which means that it needs to be an entity that you trust and ideally one that has good insight into your business and understands not just um, the data protection position, but also uh, maybe your commercial position in, in different jurisdictions um, and what activities are going on across a range of, of different jurisdictions. The other point is that if they're going to be engaging on your behalf in regulatory matters, so where there might be consequences like fines or enforcement or indeed rep reputational impacts, um, you need to have in place a robust contract with that representative um, to make sure that uh, they are going to carry liability for any harm that they do to you uh, by making, for example, a sort of damaging concession to the European, uh, the relevant sort of data uh, supervisory authority. So there's a few sort of factors that need to be thought about, not something to leave until sort of mid-November of this year. Um, you really, certainly by the summer, you should, you should have made good progress on that. Um, but each of the last two times that there have been um, the possibility of a no-deal Brexit, uh, I only really got contacted by clients about this in the weeks immediately before the deadline. And uh, if you can try and get that position resolved a bit earlier, uh, it's going to stand you in very good state because, of course, uh, guess what? Everyone else is going to be worrying about <laughs> it in those last few weeks as well. Absolutely. And as much as there has been a few um, tweets on social media and, and notices saying that there will be an adequacy agreement by the time the withdrawal agreement comes to an end, um, both we and I were discussing this before the webinar, I would simply ask you to watch the space and not be reliant on that it typically does take longer than a yeah. year to come to an adequacy agreement so don't wait for the the belief that it may happen um, there are other countries that are currently seeking an adequacy agreement from europe so as we all said your precautions should be think about it now know what your data flows are um, and engage the right people to help you um, put them uh, in place so now we've talked about uh, Brexit, I think there's a conversation about some of the ICO guidance that is coming out. And certainly um, for me, the ICO has a responsibility to um, update and issue guidance um, on a number of themes. And what has recently come out is the uh, right um, of access. So we as individuals, as you know, have the right to have access to our information. Um, and that guidance is currently out uh, to consultation. What is interesting within that guidance is that there is a statement that says that if you are asking an individual to uh, clarify what it is that they want from you as an in as an organization, you can no longer stop the clock for that. So if you get a request today and you'll say, well, an individual's asked for all their data, and you want to clarify what do you mean? Is there a particular time frame you're interested in? Are there search terms you're interested in? Even though you're asking that question, the clock continues to tick and you still have up to um, 30 days or sooner to respond um, to that. So I thought that was quite an interesting um, reference. The other um, guidance is the direct marketing um, guidance. Now, there is an ongoing uh, debate about consent versus legitimate interest. We're all waiting for Europe um, as member states to agree the new privacy um, regulation. Um, and whilst it was meant to come in at the same time as GDPR, um, it's definitely been set back. And I don't imagine it's going to be released this year. Um, but I think the responsibility remains on you as organisations to be clear about your marketing activity and what you're going to rely on, whether it be consent mm. or whether it be legitimate interest in any means that you are communicating electronically, whether it be uh, WhatsApp, Facebook messaging, um, via cookies, um, via emails, um, be clear about your <laughs> processing. 
Yeah, I mean, that last point is, is important because it's not clear from the title of the consultation, but it does have quite a lot to say about the placement of cookies and uh, all of the challenges that go alongside that. And that's a very big area. There was a report published earlier this mm -hmm. year um, which identified that a very significant proportion, about 80% or even more, of businesses across Europe are not um, complying with the existing law on, on cookies in, in the way in which they have pop-up banners and the way in which um, uh, the cookies are being placed without necessarily getting uh, GDPR compliant consent. Uh, and even those that are superficially compliant uh, are likely to be sharing that data with third parties without appropriate disclosures being made. So this is a, a big challenging area. It's one that's likely to be quite heavily uh, looked at and enforced over the next year. And it's an area where looking at what other people are doing and emulating that isn't going to be enough because the vast majority of other people are, are also non-compliant. The, the ICO themselves uh, were non-compliant on cookies until uh, relatively, I think, late in the summer mm -hmm. last year. Um, so, uh, you know, everyone that had copied their approach okay. was then kicking themselves because that was wrong. I, I also just very quickly want to pick up on the age-appropriate design mm -hmm. code. Um, there's a, that's now been finalised. That was consulted on last year. They've now published it. It has two big implications, um, one obvious and one slightly less so. The obvious one, anyone who operates a site where um, they expect uh, or, or where um, children are part of their target audience or, or, or prospective um, you know, customers of families and, and people with children um, needs to think about making sure that their privacy notice and, and everything else uh, that's related to the protection of privacy online is configured to be usable by, by children. That means thinking about the language you use in the notices, making them much less legalistic, much more something that, that a child can, can readily understand. Um, I heard a statistic, uh, I don't know uh, that it's necessarily true, but the, the average reading age of people in the UK is about 12. So, in fact, always you should be thinking about making language as sort of straightforward as possible, but particularly where uh, children are going to be a customer or a, or a user of the site, uh, you have to think about that. But the other implication of the code is that if it's a site that you expect to be of interest to children, even if it's not one that's aimed at them, the code also applies on you there. So um, publishers of adult-focused sites uh, whether that be pornography, gambling, um, vaping, uh, sales of alcohol, things where there might be an, a, an appeal or an interest for children, they have to make very sure that children can't gain access to the site, possibly by use of something like an age gate, although that's been fraught with, with difficulty, uh, or, or, by, um, or by in some way, uh, other way, constricting access to the site. Um, to, to people over the age of 18. But um, if you don't do that, then again, all of the content has to be uh, formatted in a way that's suitable for, for children and, and they have to be able to understand any notices that, that they're given because you have to assume that they're likely to, to want to visit the site. And I think the other thing that is, uh, is really interesting and what we're seeing a lot more of is the new technology that is hitting the market, which is really exciting people, you know, facial recognition. Um, there was an article about using um, AI and, um, as part of a recruitment process, you know, and it's what are the data protection implications um, of that. Now, obviously, new technology is amazing, but people really do need to be thinking about um, things such as data protection uh, by design um, and by default and doing things such as data protection um, impact assessments, which typically happen after the fact. So I get conversations with people like, oh, we've, we've created this fantastic new piece of technology, Kelly, it's going to use AI or we want to use uh, facial recognition. We've already come up with a prototype, we're ready to sell it to clients. And when I ask the question, well, did you do any kind of privacy impact assessment? They look at me blankly. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, we have the same sort of experience on um, in, in the work that I do. And when, I mean, as this slide sort of says, um, we're starting to see a uh, much greater focus on this in two different ways. Firstly, from the ICO themselves, mm. um, they, they've published sort of guidance on how, how you do a data protection impact assessment and the circumstances in which it's appropriate or mandatory to do it. 
but we are also starting to see um you know where where we're acting for say the vendors of new technologies we're starting to see uh, their customers uh, expecting to be provided with a copy of that impact assessment uh, at an early stage in the negotiation to be able to satisfy themselves that this is a product that's been sort of carefully thought about and, and that the implications of it are, are being managed. That doesn't absolve the customer from maybe doing their own assessment before they deploy the technology, mm -hmm. but they want to know that at a manufacturer level, uh, impacts have been considered and, and as far as possible, mitigated through the through the design of the technology and we've listed some questions about what should be um assessed and something that i'm quite keen on is asking the question as to whether or not it's ethical and i think in the last year there have been a number of reports in the press about how people are being underhanded in how they are collecting uh information from individuals um without them knowing so i really want people to consider whether it just be the simple that you're going to be introducing a new HR system or a new accounting system, I want you to think about, like Will said, have you considered an impact assessment, but is what you're going to be collecting ethical? Um, and if you can satisfy that, that's brilliant. Um, but you also can ask those questions of the vendor who's providing you with the tool. Is there anything else that they are harvesting behind the scenes um, about your information? So you have a responsibility to ask those questions before you invest uh, in that um, technology. And I think we're gonna see a lot more um, challenges around uh, privacy and whether or not an impact assessment um, has been done. Yeah, just, just on that point, I mean, I think one of the things that sometimes uh, hampers this is that people are somehow afraid of, of either subjecting their, their product or their, their approach to scrutiny or they're worried that if they are open and transparent about what they're planning to do with the data, that it will cause people to be anxious or, or that they'll be criticised. And actually, my experience has been very different, that the more open a business is, uh, the greater the degree of confidence that engenders, both in customers, but also in, in end users. And that actually, uh, if you are completely transparent about the processing you're proposing to do, and you're able to explain that you've put in place safeguards and that you've thought about uh, things like that Kelly's been talking about earlier about you know how long you're going to keep it for and what access controls there might be around it and these things actually people will be fairly relaxed they understand i think better than they used to the sort of core transaction about giving up a degree of personal data in return for what is otherwise a free service um so they're comfortable with that provided that things are transparent but again and again the businesses that take the reputational hit are the ones who've used woolly language or tried to cover things up um and then it's come to light uh, and in those circumstances there's a sort of erosion of trust that it's very very difficult to get back and certainly i think leading on from that i i think it's fair to say that certainly the uk since the regulation came into force hasn't um massively been big on um, enforcement notices that we know of. Um, we've obviously heard about BA uh, and the Marriott, although they are still in the uh, negotiation with the Information uh, Commissioner, um, whereas our counterparts in Europe, uh, some of the other um, DPAs have actually been vastly more aggressive with the, the regulation and almost weekly enforcing uh, fines um, on companies. So Will's just going to talk to us about, you know, is this the year, is 2020 the year that suddenly we see a lot more, not just enforcement notice, but challenges in court? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's two parts to this. I mean, if we actually if we just look at the bottom bullet point here, you can sort of see that BA and Marriott that Kelly mentioned um, uh, and actually the others as well. These are all businesses where there has been ICO enforcement action, um, where there's been investigation. And in the case of BA and Marriott, um, notices of an intention to, to raise a fine uh, in very significant sums in, into the millions. Um, uh, but what we're seeing off the back of that, and, and the thing that I think is going to be quite a developing trend this year, is uh, solicitors going out, gathering up the details of individuals who have been affected by these breaches and putting together um, potential sort of class action litigation uh, against those defendants. Now, all of those uh, named are relatively big 
deep pockets organizations. Um, but that's not to say that, that claims can't be made against businesses that are smaller and, and um, potentially much less able to weather um, the cost and the, and the sort of loss of business management time and things that go along with uh, big, you know, wide ranging litigation. Uh, Morrison's is, is quite a good case in point here. Um, and the particular feature of Morrison's that I want to talk about, this is the, the supermarket chain. The particular feature that I want to talk about is that it illustrates a risk that is very, very difficult for most employers, most um, data controllers to manage. In Morrison's, the breach was carried out by an individual who was employed by them. He was one of their aud internal auditors and he was not happy and he decided that he was going to punish his employer by orchestrating a data breach. He collected together the payroll information of about 100,000 members of staff and then uh, uploaded that to the internet. And when no one sort of latched onto that, he sent it to a couple of newspapers. Now, I mean, that was a, that was a criminal offence. He went to prison for five years for that. Morrison's opened themselves up for investigation by the ICO. The ICO said basically there was nothing they could have done to prevent it. They, they'd done everything they ought to. They put in place fraud protection for all of the affected staff. Um, so, uh, you know, these packages that monitor whether um, whether your account's being used for fraudulent purposes and uh, insurance and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, they're being sued through the courts for compensation for the distress and anxiety that's been caused by the loss. And so far, uh, we're waiting for a decision from the Supreme Court on this, but so far, the... Um, the the, um, uh, the courts have said that Morrison's, as the employer, is vicariously liable, even though that is effectively giving this individual what he wanted of punishing Morrison's for something that he'd set out, you know, in a very deliberate and calculated way to do. Um, and then you combine that with the implications of the Lloyd and Google decision, which says that basically you can have a breach where you've lost control of your data, even where you've not suffered any loss or even suffered any sort of distress and anxiety. Um, that, that was a case where um, Google had been using a setting in the Chrome browser to basically track behavior of iPhone users, even when the iPhone users had enabled do not track at a, at a device level um, in, their, um, in their iPhones. And <clears throat> there was no uh, financial harm. Uh, it was very difficult to say that anyone had actually suffered any distress or anxiety as a result of effectively a cookie being placed where it shouldn't have been. But the court has nevertheless said, you lost control over an aspect of your personal data um, and you ought to be compensated for that. Um, obviously, the amount at stake for an individual claimant is very small, but this is where the threat of class action comes along. Because if you've got hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of claimants, um, obviously those uh, the, the, the costs and the damages liability increase. And coming back to Morrison's, um, you know, the court was asked, well, isn't the effect of this that Morrison's is going to be exposed to a massive liability that it shouldn't have? The court's answer was, well, they should insure against it. They weren't prepared to give them any protection through the courts against the consequences of that decision. Now, not many businesses will be in that sort of position, but it is certainly something that we're seeing more of. And I think as that type of litigation becomes more widespread and more well known, uh, what we're also seeing is people having a pop. You know, they've got an argument about an invoice or they're an employee who's leaving the company under a cloud. Um, and suddenly a data protection claim gets lumped into the mix just as, a, as an extra way of causing some hassle to the business or maybe getting a bit of extra compensation. So uh, it is something to be alert to, uh, and I, I fear you know it is something we're going to see quite a lot more of over the next 12 months. So for those that are listening to the, the webinar, would you suggest that they speak to their insurance brokers to say, obviously, you put everything in place that you can do to mitigate against a breach, but should there be having conversations with insurance brokers to say, in a scenario where we receive a complaint from an individual for compensation, um, should they have appropriate insurance to cover that? Yeah, I think they should. Uh, the difficulty you are likely to find is that um, 
there isn't really a sort of comprehensive data breach package for insurance available yet. Okay. There's sort of cyber risk insurance to cover you against some aspects. There might be, um, you know, insurance against criminal acts like hacking or, or like we were describing in the Morrison's case. Um, but it tends to have to be a bit of a jigsaw puzzle of different types of insurance cover and very little of that's been tested as yet. So um, it, it's difficult to know exactly what the policy will answer and how it will how it will respond to to individual breaches. Uh, the other thing, just, just to sort of maybe cap that point off, that you should think about uh, if you're concerned about this is, is your supply chain. If you're the controller of data and you've got a chain of processes, you might be confident that you've got all your systems robust and in place, but all of your suppliers, your data processes need to have those uh, arrangements in place as well, because mm -hmm. without that, um, you're ultimately going to be the one carrying the can. And if you haven't got a good liability provision in your data processing agreement, you may never be able to recover the cost to you of that breach from, from your processor. Excellent. Okay, so we've now come to the part of the uh, session where we've got um, some questions. Um, and so what I'd like to, so firstly, I apologize to anyone that's had no sound. Um, I will um, have conversations with you afterwards and, and make this um, available to you. So sorry if you've uh, missed out on listening to this. The Audible will be recorded via the, the webinar, so apologies for that. So the questions really are now for you. So um, for those of you that are on the uh, line, do you have any specific questions about what um, we have covered? Um, or do you have any specific data protection questions that you may have um, for us, uh, whether it be myself or, um, or Will, we are open to you to ask us any question that you may have. So feel free to start typing. Ah. So the first question we have is how should we be recording internal um, data breaches? And I think it is a good question. Um, for me, you should have a policy about um, what are data breaches. Your staff should be educated so they are understanding what a breach is. And a breach could be you simply send an email with an attachment to the wrong person. Happens a lot. Um, so you, I would want you, even if it ha doesn't have to go to the information commissioner, I'd want you to have a log file. Now that can be a simple Excel spreadsheet that allows you to capture who reported the breach, what was the date that it was recorded, what was it? You know, what was it that you're actually talking about? What could you have done to have prevented it? What have you done now to address um, those risks? And what I'd be really interested in is that log being shared with your board so they're aware of what it is, because it may allude to a training need um, across your stuff, because you may find that your biggest area of risk is emails going to the wrong people, which 50% of all breaches are. Um, so uh, it may be a good business case to put forward to your management team for uh, training. But that's what I would want um, as a log file. I don't know if you no, want. I, I agree with that. There's a couple of things I'd add. One is about culture. Um, if, you're, if you want to make sure that that, record is useful you need to have a culture that encourages people to come forward which means if not a no blame culture at least a low blame culture um, to encourage people to to come forward with uh, breaches the other thing that i think is really good to capture in that if you can is near misses so where you might have had a breach but in the nick of time you know someone's intercepted something yeah. or or your systems have operated to prevent something from from happening because actually if you just sort of look at the near misses again for the reasons that Kelly's saying you know it might identify a structural requirement it might identify a training requirement but you can by looking at the near misses hopefully head that off before it turns into something uh, that's potentially really harmful to the business Excellent. So the next question we have is where the data controller is in the UK, but the data is being processed in the EU, such as a cloud data center. Um, there is no instruction such as standard contract clauses that fits. What do you um, suggest? Yeah, so um, that is quite a tricky one. And, and I mean, there isn't very there isn't a very clear answer. The ICO's guidance actually, um, and this was given at a at a practitioner conference, but they, they've subsequently endorsed it um, in guidance on their site, is basically to take um, the standard contractual clauses and modify them. The standard contractual clauses say very clearly, do not modify. 
this will be invalid if you modify it but they basically say look something is better than nothing and if you take it and basically thinking about putting in place an appropriate regime of safeguarding and protection you modify it in a way that gives substantive effect to that um you know they that they would regard that as better than than nothing at all but it is problematic we're starting to see a few european jurisdictions publishing updated gdpr compliant SCCs. None of those have been adopted as yet, but they're out there, and some of them are definitely worth looking at um, because they they cover a wider range and they're a bit more up to date. Uh, the the existing SCCs really didn't contemplate the cloud um, type arrangements at all. Um, but I, I think the answer is have something rather than nothing, um, and uh, a, a, and often uh, you can get quite close to the to the substance of the protections that are required even if that does mean doing some harm to the to the language of the of the standard clauses excellent so the uh, next question that we have do hr records include supervision notes hr complaints and concerns um, so for example should these be stored in hr files should they be retained along with other documents in line with retention or should they be destroyed when staff leave? So firstly, supervision notes, um, HR complaints are very much part of the employee HR file. Um, in terms of complaints, um, in terms of the complaints sitting with the HR file, it depends on how long um, or how severe that complaint is about the member of staff. So if you've gone down a grievance route, uh, and the grievance has um, taken place, you have a certain period of time where that grievance sits on the employee HR file, and at which point, once that grievance has ended and they're still in your employment, you shouldn't really have the details of that anymore. It's very much like having points on your um, driving license. Once you've um, reached the uh, period of time that they were on your license, they then essentially become no longer valid, and you can ask for an updated driving license. The same applies to grievances. I would keep all supervision notes um, with the HR vial. I'd be very conscious about what's in those supervision notes because remember they could be subject to the subject access request that comes in from a member of staff. Um, and I would retain them for the same period of time that you retain uh, the HR file, which is up to uh, six years. What you don't need to retain are things such as training records, unless the training record relates to a speciality that the individual has and you need to demonstrate uh, their compliance uh, whilst working with you. So keep it all and I would keep it for a minimum of um, six years after they've left um, your organisation, whether it be paper or electronic, and then have a process to remove those. Yeah, the, the one thing I would add to that just on the training records point, and it's, a, it's quite a niche exemption, but it is one that's worth just thinking about sometimes people will be operating in old buildings um there might be issues with asbestos mm -hmm. something like that uh, in those circumstances claims can be made many many years later because a claim might be made um within three years i think of of the of the condition coming to light which might be a decade two decades after the individual has has retired from the business um, in those circumstances, it will be necessary for the business mm -hmm. to produce evidence that they trained that member of staff on an appropriate way to work within an environment which is asbestos rich. Um, so those types of examples, and, and you know, really that's more just to highlight, there may be exceptions to this, and the, mm -hmm. there isn't a sort of blanket date by which you can be confident everything can be erased. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a school, um, records relating to young people um, should be kept for at least until at least a couple of years after uh, they've reached adulthood, mm -hmm. because again they can bring claims uh, after they've after they've become adults um, within a, within two or three years. So um, take advice on these sort of points, but it's just worth sort of thinking about all of the different circumstances in which uh, you might have to refer back to those records uh, for protection of your business, really. Um. So the question is, we've added GDPR to all team meetings as an agenda item, but often gets overlooked. Do you have any suggestions to keep it short and pithy? Um, for me, what I would do is I would 
just use examples that have hit the press. So one of the things I talked about when I came back from um, Christmas was, did anyone see that the honours list got uploaded to the uh, public domain and had all people's address details, including not just celebrities, but some very high profile individuals in government? If we were to do that, how would we um, resolve that? What would be our actions? And that's all it is. It can be a five minute conversation to say, here's a real life example, what do we do? Or for example, uh, Dixon's and Curry's, you know, we've not updated our software. We were subject to um, an attack. What do we do? So the question may be, how up to date are our systems? And just have that as a round table conversation. And it doesn't have to be long, but what you're doing is you're using a real example where it's been hit the press and you can say, what would we do in that situation? And then if you have real examples of what's happened in your business, then I would definitely talk um, about mm. those. It makes the point that we all made about it being a culture, something that you're talking about um, more often. One thing you can do is configure something like a Google News Alert so that it searches for terms like GDPR and data breach just in the news. You get like a weekly digest email or something with just some headlines of, of significant news items. So you don't have to go out and look for it. It comes into your inbox and then just have a scan through that, pick something that looks like it might have some relevance to your business and then flag that at the next meeting. So another question we have is about, um, should we remove personal data, um, such as photocopies of passports and driving license once a staff member has left, but keep other relevant uh, HR records? Um, I think if we go back to the point that Will made, and I think it is one that is important, is that there will be certain things within your HR file that may have been set down in legislation that tell you how long you should be keeping information that may not be covered by the blanket um, six years after an employee um, leaves. So um, I would say things like driving license, they are predominantly, well, your photo for your passport are predominantly used for right to work checks. So once you've done that check um, and you've proved that the individual has the right to work in the UK, would you need to keep it once they've left? Because the um, home office could come in and do an audit but they're unlikely to do it after X number of years. So really look at what is contained in your HR file, see if there is legislation that's telling you how long you need to hold that data for a minimum and maximum period. And where it's not, challenge yourself with the what's reasonable in terms of holding um, that information, um, which should then sit in your retention schedule, but should also sit in your um, register of processing um, activities. Yeah, sometimes it won't be necessary to retain it at all. No. You might, if you don't have a legislative requirement, you might be satisfied with something, you know, a signature from maybe two managers that says, we've seen this ID, yeah. we're happy it matches. Um, and then the person can take their ID away with them and you, you don't keep a copy at all. Yeah. Provided you're confident in your systems and your staff, that might be all you need. Um, but where you might have a documentary requirement for audit or um, like um, in my line of work with law firms, uh, for the money laundering regulations, you need to have that information for five years, but you then have to delete it after five years. Um, you, um, you know, you've just got to make sure your systems are set up to uh, identify anything that's been kept for that length of time and get rid of it. Uh, and obviously, the greater the risk that the data can be used for impersonation uh, or for some sort of fraud, uh, the more the greater the protection you need to have in place around that data. Um, so another question we have is a follow on from the asbestos uh, discussion we just had. So in regards to the chemical asbestos, is it OK to keep all the signed risk assessments they have um, to demonstrate they've acknowledged um, that? I would say that you want the records to demonstrate you've done the training, but you've also you've done the risk assessments and you might want to look at things like the health and safety um, guidelines in terms of what they expect you um, to keep because uh, they will set down what they're looking for um, in terms of information. Your insurance uh, may also stipulate what they're expecting as evidence from you to, to they can defend you in the case of a, um, a claim. Um, and some insurance companies are quite prescriptive about what they're looking for. So I would, if you're uncertain and you can't find it written down, ask your insurance provider um, uh, for sure. Um, so um, what we've got is a question about WhatsApp. 
I was told by a member of staff that we didn't have to worry about this because everyone gives their details by consent. Should this be in our uh, data controller documentation? I think that um, messaging apps, not just WhatsApp, um, are a risk um, because very much like anything, if you are discussing date individuals within your business if it's a social thing outside of work i'm not bothered about it but if in that group conversation you happen to make comments about an individual remember that they can be subject to a subject access request we've had to go to one client and tell them to give the transcript of all of their text messages to be able to demonstrate that they did not say uh, disclose information about an individual so what's that very much is can be treated like email if you are disclosing personal information about staff about your customers about your clients or your suppliers remember it could be subject to the subject access uh, request so you definitely want it documented and also consider if you're using something like whatsapp or, or slack is a popular one as an actual sort of team uh, communication method they are a they are a data processor yeah. you, you're going to have a controller processor relationship with them so that needs to be documented in your records of processing activity and you need to be able to show that you've looked at the contract now obviously you're not going to negotiate terms with facebook around uh what um what can be communicated through whatsapp but they um you nevertheless need to show that you've scrutinized those terms and thought about the safeguards that, that puts in place and if, uh, as I think WhatsApp probably does, it talks about transfers of data to other countries, uh, that's something that needs to be included in your privacy notice to your staff, um, because you, that, that that's something which you are effectively authorising by running that software. Mm -hmm. And obviously individuals have the right to say they're not happy with that use. So if this is about communicating with young people, um, there must be alternative means. It can't be the only means that you're using um, to communicate. And again, do a risk assessment. Is that the most appropriate method uh, to be uh, engaging um, individuals uh, with? Because there is a risk. There always, everything does come with a risk. So do the risk assessment would be my um, suggestion. Um, we've got a question about cookies. If a customer requests a subject access request, is cookie consent to be included in this? If so, how do we identify the user given that cookies will be associated with the device rather than a person such as um, an email address? So obviously the, the subject access request is whether or not it's about personal data. So if through that cookie, there is some way that you can identify who the individual is, then it could form part of a subject access request, but to be fair, I've never seen cookies mm. as part of it. If you've got a cookie consent tool, you should be able to demonstrate that you've had cookie consent from a device, but unless you could link it with some kind mm. of personal data to say this device belongs to this individual, I don't see how it would part, form part of a subject access yeah, request. Yeah, agreed. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the relevant thing will be, what is it a, a request about? With cookies, it's a bit complicated because under PECR, there is a requirement for consent, but that's a slightly different requirement to the requirement under um, GDPR. Uh, it uses the same test, but it's a consent to the placing of an electronic record. It's about data, but not necessarily about personal data. So depending on how your cookies are configured, they could be effectively anonymous. What you're talking about is a situation where um, you can't really tie that information to uh, an individual. It might still behave like personal data, so it might uh, remember the device and behave as if uh, it remembers the visitor. But unless that's actually tied to like an account reference or an email address or something like that, it's probably not going to be personal data for the purposes of a subject mm -hmm. access request. Um, that said, if someone comes and says, I want personal data, I want, I want to make a subject access request, and one of the identifiers that they use is, say, the MAC address of their device or, or something else that's relevant to um, identify, you know, that actually ties them to the cookies. Well, at that point, I think that is an area that you'd have to look at. And certainly you couldn't reject a subject access request just because it was directed to, well, what cookie information have you, have you stored about the device I've used to visit you? Um, but it would have to be, uh, you, you'd have to be clear that that isn't um, the same category of personal data as you're storing 
uh, in relation to their name, email address, telephone number, that sort of thing. So f really through the cookie notice and the privacy notice, you could set out um, what you're classing as personal data that you're processing and, and advise the individuals that the cookies that you're collecting are defined as this um, and being transparent about that. Yeah. So that it almost mitigates that yes, question exactly. of, of in a subject access request. Okay. Um, so um, we've got a couple about subject access requests. So the next question is, for a subject access request that requests all emails between two named people on a particular topic, is it appropriate to supply emails between other people that mention the same data subject or topic? I think for me, this is where you, the letter of the regulation from, or should I say within subject access request, if they've been specific about what they've asked for, so they've asked for all emails between two named people, that is what I'd respond to because that's what they've asked for. Um, you could ask them if they want more, if you're prepared to do that additional search. Um, bear in mind, it is timely and you'd have to do a lot more redaction. Um, but for me, the subject access request is the individual wants communication between X and Y. They may even tell you the time frame, and that's what I'd respond to. And that's what I'd, I'd put in my log file um, as well. Because whilst you may want to be helpful, I'd stick to what they've actually asked. Yeah. Um, bear in mind that it's only the personal data within those documents that's that's properly responsive yeah. to, to a subject access request. That said, um, unless you were particularly inclined to be difficult, quite an easy way of responding to this would actually be to get the permission of the, the counterpart to the communications to disclose the, the, their, you know, effectively their personal data as well, because then you can actually give them the complete email address. But if for whatever reason you were disinclined to do that, uh, and in any case, if someone else was copied into parts of these exchanges or, um, you know, there was personal data about a third party, uh, within those communications, that really ought to be redacted and, and kept outside of the um, uh, of, of the scope of what what you provide under a response. Um, so the next question is: um, We're taking um, Skype and Team Chat to form part of a subject um, access request, and I think this is about: Does the does Skype or your Teams chat retain that information? So if it's retained whether it be in the cloud or there is a transcript of that conversation, whether it be a recording, so you've actually got the voice recording of that conversation or there is a text uh, record. If you've got that, you should have a clear definition of why you're storing that date, that information, what's the purpose and how long. And absolutely, if as part of that Skype conversation, you happen to name individuals and you talk about them, um, then that does form part of a subject access request. But you also have a responsibility as part of that call to tell people that it's being recorded so they know um, that. So tell them it's going to be recorded, tell them it's going to be stored um, and how they can access it, or simply say it's not recorded and you've got no evidence of that conversation. It's, it's your choice as to what to do. But for me, if you're storing it, it is personal data. Uh, if you are disclosing people's names, uh, opinions about them, uh, and they do have the right to access that information. Um, there was, um, uh, let me see if there are any other questions that we have. Uh, no, we've covered the aspect stars. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got a question. Should a data protection impact assessment be done retrospectively for processes already in place? Um, so as part of the regulation, um, they became mandatory for high risk um, data processing. So um, you may wish, I would say, to be reassured that all the systems you have in place, you have considered all of the risk factors. Um, that's a lot of work, I would say, if for pre 25th of May 2018. But if you want the reassurance, you might want to do that, especially if you're working with vulnerable adults. Uh, for example, um, but there is no requirement in the law for you to go back uh, and do that. Where there is a requirement, if after May 2018, um, you have to do a data protection impact assessment if you're working with 
um, large geographical area, if you are working with um, highly special categories of information, such race, religion, or health. Um, but no, you, you can choose to, but yeah. no. Also some, some sort of mandatory ones, uh, if you're doing CCTV. Yeah. Um, you need to you need to have thought about that, um, and and there are some other types of processing that will always um, require an impact assessment. If you've if you've put that in place in the last couple of years and you haven't done one, uh, you, you definitely should. Um, but but Kelly's right, you know, you, uh, it's quite a burdensome task to go back and and do a lot of stuff predating May twenty eighteen, uh, which you shouldn't need to. Um, that said. Uh, you know, you're never going to be criticised for having an impact assessment. You could be criticised for not having one if the if the processing's of the sort of character that would trigger the requirement. Okay. Excellent. So um, that was a very intense 25 minutes of uh, questions. What I would say to anybody that's on the webinar, if there are questions that have come about afterwards, um, please feel free uh, to email me. And if I can't answer them, I'll certainly let um we'll have the question and i'll come back to you afterwards the webinar has been um recorded and will be made available afterwards um what i'd simply ask before anyone signs off of the uh the webinar is if anyone is interested in a quick phone call with either myself or will following this can you just type in the chat box that you would like a follow-up call and who you'd like that call with. Obviously, there's absolutely no obligation um, for that. And if you all say no, that's cool. You'll just get the um, the webinar. Um, obviously, if, if you've got any uh, legal advice and guidance, I would recommend um, that you speak to um, Will from Freeps. And obviously, if you want any practical advice and guidance, you know, I would hope that you would come uh, to us. But again, there's no obligation. So. Can I ask you to type yes in the box if you'd like a uh, follow-up call with uh, Will or I? Um, but like I said, you don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. And um, yeah, yeah, really, really good questions. Thank you, and uh, I hope it's been been useful to you all. Uh, thanks for your attention this morning. Yeah, and um, thank you, Will, for uh, joining me. Um, it's always <laughs> useful to have a bit of interaction uh, on a on a webinar um, and for, on a subject that is constantly um, uh, evolving. And thank you, everybody, that has joined us for an hour of your time um, this Tuesday morning. Happy day to Privacy Day! Um, yay, we have a day to celebrate. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thank you very much, and uh, you'll all get a copy of the webinar. Um, so thank you and I will um, I will um, follow up with anyone that asks so thank you feel free to